our fifth lecture in the genotyping chip data analysis and GWAS lecture series. Um, so before I go on, let's just make sure everyone can hear me. Perfect. Okay. So in this lecture, we'll be uh, looking at the concept of population structure in GWAS studies uh, and why it's important to consider this in GWAS studies and also looking at methods that we can use to correct for population structure in GWAS. Um, so before we start, just a bit of housekeeping rules. So for everyone that's logged in, we ask you that you please uh, keep your audio on mute and make sure that your mic is on mute throughout the entire lecture. Uh, we will have a session for questions uh, during the lecture and after the lecture. Um, we also ask that if you do have a question during the lecture, that you type it into the chat box, um, and then we'll address those questions again, uh, either during the lecture when we have a break or at the end of the lecture. Um, and then also, uh, I just want to mention uh, that, oh, and at the end of this lecture, uh, once the lecture is completed, you uh, you will have a have a chance to fill in an attendance uh, attendance form, which will open up in your browser once the lecture is finished. Um, so make sure that you do stay on and uh, complete that attendance register at the end of the at the end of the, the lecture. And this is particularly important for people who are attending the hands-on workshop later in the year. Okay, so uh, let's get on with today's lecture. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for, for this session in the GWAS lecture series. Um, it's Dr. Nanyo Chowdhury. Um, and Nanyo uh, obtained his master's in zoology from the University of Kalyani, India, and a PhD in bioinformatics from the University of Kolkata in India. He then moved to South Africa in 2010 to join uh, the Sydney Brenner Institute for Molecular Biosciences at uh, the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, he's presently employed uh, at the Sydney Brenner as a senior scientist and is busy with various, various projects, including co leading the Awigen Genome Wide Association Study as well as the Awigen Population Study. Uh, and he's contributed to various projects, uh, major genomics projects in Africa, including the African Genome Variation Project, uh, the design of the HG Africa chip, uh, which we're talking about in this course, uh, the HG Africa Whole Genome Study, and the Southern African Human Genome Program. Um, so his key interests are population genomics, genomics of complex traits, uh, and developing computational resources for genomic analysis. So thank you again, Ananya, for, for agreeing to give us this uh, interesting talk. And uh, over to you. Thanks a lot, Sean. Uh, you guys can hear me clearly? Yes. Great. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for making it to the talk. I have a good and a bad news to start with. So let's start with the bad news. The bad news is that in contrast to the previous lecture by seasoned lecturers such as Sean, Michelle, and Scott, this will be a more amateurish affair. This is also because I'm not yet comfortable with the online platform and not being able to see the reaction makes it a bit difficult for me to pace the lecture, but hopefully you will help me to get used to it. And the good news is that this talk is going to be a tad shorter than the previous ones. So I hope to finish it in an hour. So a fair deal, right? So today's lecture dis will describing population structure is divided into four sections. The first section would introduce you to the concept of population structure in GWAS. In the second section, I would describe the types of structure and explain how they originate. The third and the fourth sections are more technical and would be related to detection and correction of population structures, respectively. As this lecture would throw a few concepts at you and at a rather rapid pace, I would stop at the end of each section to take a sip of water and your questions and also to check if you are still with me and then proceed from there. So let's start. Good luck with staying awake. So as you can see, the first section will introduce you to the, the basic concepts of association testing, explain what stratification and confounders are with some toy examples, and then we will come to population structure and how they apply to us. So to understand association testing, let us start with the toy example. 
Let us assume that there is a particular brand of fertilizer which promises to increase vitamin C content in fruits. So what we want to test is whether the fertilizer is actually associated with increase in vitamin C content. The experimental design for such studies is very simple. So what we would do is we would measure vitamin C levels in fruits that are grown with fertilizers. We call it site A and without fertilizers, we call it site B. Uh, you could also call site A cases and site B controls. So if there is a statistically significant difference between the mean vitamin C levels in the two sites, we would concede that there is an association between fertilizers and vitamin C levels. So let us assume that we compared oranges from the two sites and we see that there is actually no difference between the means. So therefore we reject the association. But now let us say what happens instead of comparing only oranges, we started comparing mixed bags of apples and oranges. Why? Well, let us assume that they come in mixed bags and our machines could not separate them. So what will happen if we compare mixed bags of apple and oranges? As long as their numbers are similar in the two groups, this testing will be stretched a bit, but would still be possible. However, what happens when we are comparing unequal number of apples and oranges in the two groups? We will see a clear difference in vitamin C level because we are literally comparing apples and oranges. However, these differences would not have anything to do with the fertilizer, but will be a function of the difference in the number of oranges in the two groups. So this is a typical case of sample stratification, where association is observed due to a systemic difference in the groups rather than the difference in the major variable. I'm just stopping for a while. There are some people think, stating that they cannot hear. Is there something we can do about that, Sean? Yeah, I think we're fine, Ananya. I think carry on. I think some people are having issues, but carry on. Perfect. Okay, good. So now, okay, let's. So what we are going to do is we are going to look at another example. So let us say here what we are trying to do is, for example, we are testing that if there is a diet supplement that promises to grow long hair. We are assuming that there are two possible phenotypes. People can either have long hair or short hair. So can you see a difference between long hair frequencies in the two groups? Definitely. But is it due to the supplement? A second look uh, into the picture will tell you that it's actually due to the gender differences in the two groups and not the supplement. As gender in, in this example is related to hair length, girls have longer hair and they have di different frequencies in the two groups. One group has more girls than the other. It affects the outcome and produces false association. So the factors other than the major variable which could affect the outcome are known as covariates or confounders. And this phenomena is known as confounding. So then we move to another toy example, the final one. Okay, so you can see a regression plot in the bottom. So this plot is kind of dealing with the, uh, the number of ice cream cones sold per day and the number of drowning events. So you can see there is a clear correlation between number of ice cream cones sold and number of drowning events. So is this real? Or from a previous experience, we can say that there is a confounder. So let's assume that there is a confounder. So the first issue will be to identify what the confounder could be. Well, if you think of when would you like to have ice cream cone and also go for swimming, you will think, okay, summer times, right? So if you use temperature, uh, if you use absolute heat as a confounder, which is shown in the middle plot, you will see the association becomes weaker. And if you use the absolute temperature, which is the right-hand side plot, you can see it almost disappears. Sorry, so the association between between ice cream and drowning was confounded by temperature. This example not only demonstrates how easily confounding can produce curious associations, but also shows that these, if identified and corrected, can actually prevent false association due to confounding. So uh, though you will be given a very detailed account of association testing in lecture seven, I decided to include a basic introduction because 
I mean, just to give you a, a feel of what it is, and also this would enable us to explore how population structure affects genetic association study. So the, this is the simplest form of GWAS. This is a case control study. And this is very similar to previous examples. The only difference here is that the variables compared in the two groups are allele frequencies of a snake. So in the simplest form, you can take up a set of cases. Here you can see people with heart diseases and compare them to controls, which are people without any heart disease. And then for each SNP, you compare the allele frequencies in the cases and the controls. As expected, most SNPs would have very similar allele frequencies. However, as, as you see in this figure, that the C allele has much higher frequency in cases than controls. And if this is found to be statistically significant, you would say this is associated to the trait. So these are one kind of traits that are that are kind of addressed with GWA studies. The other kind of traits are continuous traits, such as high BMI or blood pressure. So here we use a linear regression model in which a phenotype, which can be BMI, height, or blood pressure, which is shown as Y, is modeled using the genotype as a major variable, which is given as X. As an individual can have 0, 1, or 2 alleles at a SNP locus, you can see in the next plot what you can see is that the levels of phenotype changes with addition of equal e with each allele is something that we are trying to model. And the beta coefficients, which is actually the slope of the line, represent the strength of that association. So the let's say this is a case where you have additive models. So each allele adds some value to the phenotype. You can also model other kinds of inheritances, such as dominant and recessive using this framework. So you just need to modify it a bit. For example, the plot below shows that if you are looking at a dominant model, then what you see is that you consider two genotypes, uh, two genotypic state instead of, instead of three. So the two state correspond to the dominant allele present, which are the capital A small a genotypes and the capital A capital A genotype, and its absence, which are the small a small a genotypes. So it's good to remember here that the basic assumptions for a GWAS is that for is that the participants need to be genetically unrelated. Moreover, if you are trying to use a linear regression model, the trait also requires to be normally distributed. For traits which are not normally distributed, there are transformations available, but I think that will be covered again in lecture seven. So, but keep these pointers in mind when we, you go to that do that lecture. So now we, we have got some basic idea of GWAS. So let us try to see uh, another interesting GWAS example. So using chopsticks is a, school, is a very cool skill, right? Especially if you are a frequent visitor to a Chinese restaurant. So a group of geneticists decided to identify if there is a genetic variation associated to this. So they use a very simple case control design in which top chopstick users comprise, is of, comprise the cases and the non-users became the controls. Uh, interestingly, just to note, the samples were taken from San Francisco in the USA. So the association identified a very interesting hit on chromosome 6, which had a very high p-value, and they replicated the different parts in the US, and they found it to be significantly associated. So they were very excited and named this loci sushi, which is successful use of selected hand instrument gene. So nice story, but however, when a year later they revisited the data, they identified that there was a major problem. This problem was ethnic stratification in the two groups. As you can see in the figure, the chopstick users are predominantly East Asians, shown as EA and by green labels. And the controls were predominantly Europeans, shown by red and labeled as EU. And you, they also found that the sushi variant itself has a strong frequency difference in Europeans and East Asians. Therefore, it was not the chopstick skills, but the East Asian ancestry that was confounding the association. This story is uh, never happened. This is a conceptual story, but it kind of is very nicely described in this 2005 paper, which beware of the chopstick gene. And there is also a very nice commentary describing the nuances of population structure in that 2012 paper shown on right. Both are very short papers, but and have wonderful reads. So please give them a try to understand use a bit better. So fun chopstick GWAS story that we kind of covered right now 
was designed to illustrate the concept of population stratification or structure. They are essentially the same thing. Uh, this is the presence of multiple subpopulation, example individuals from different ethnic backgrounds in a study. Subpopulations, in addition to differing in allele frequencies, might also differ in actual disease rates, trade variables, cultural practices, diet, etc. If both allele frequencies and trade variables differ between subpopulations, PS can lead to either false positive associations or they can even mask two, two associations. The concept of PS was around since early 1990s, but was strongly uh, kind of established by these two seminal papers published in 2002 and 2004. So they are also good, good references to follow. So just to kind of illustrate it a bit further, this figure from Jonathan Marshini's paper in 2004 kind of also puts up an example of how PS works. So in this example, you can see it consists of two populations. And the three genotypes are shown in red, blue, and green. And you can see here that there is an excess of individuals from population two uh, in the cases, which is kind of shown by the blue ancestry. And also these are the small alleles. So therefore, there's a difference in allele frequency between the two groups, which could kind of lead to a confounding. The table next to it also illustrates the same phenomena. And here, what you see is that you don't see any association in pop either population one or population two. However, if you club these population together, due to inherent differences in allele frequencies in the two populations, you might see confounding. It is important to note that GWA studies have many other confounders. So population structure is only one of them. So these are like age, sex, BMI, socioeconomic status. However, other confounders are easier to detect because you can do just a statistical analysis to detect them, and they could also be more directly corrected. On the other hand, population structure requires special methods for detection as well as quantification. So finally, uh, I would kind of, we'll see one example. Okay. So this is a real world example of how GWAS could confound it by population structure. So this is a study by Campbell and colleague, which was published in 2005, and that demonstrated this very nicely and has been a flagship for this idea. So in this study, the authors aim to identify genetic variants that are associated to height, and this was in a panel of European American individuals. So European individuals living in America, they identify a very exciting SNP in the LCT gene. We'll also come back to LCT in a while. So this is a particular variant that allows ad ad adults to milk uh, to digest milk and they found this LCT variant to be strongly associated to height. They also noted a clear difference in allele frequency of the SNP as you can see in the top plot between Northwest and Southeast European population. So what makes this study special is that they did not stop there but they tried to investigate whether population structure was actually causing this difference. So what they did was they divided the European populations further by ancestry as illustrated by the bar plots. And they kind of found that if you kind of really uh, structured this by European ancestry, the association that which you see initially are kind of goes away. So this study was also important because it again shows that you, I mean, if you really kind of take ancestry into consideration, you will not only detect stratification, but also you can correct for it. So with this example, we have covered section one. So before we move to the next, I would like to stop and check if there are any questions. Okay, I don't think there are questions. Great, so then let's move to the next section. So this section uh, will kind of introduce various types of population structure and we will very briefly and superficially, but we'll try to delve into what generates population structure at the first place. So 
the population structure has been classified into different categories. So the first is what we have seen in the example of Northwest Europeans and Southeast Europeans in the Campbell study mentioned a bit ago. So this is just due to in, uh, inclusion of geographically distinct populations in the study. So this idea was floated by Eric Lander and then kind of developed in 1994 and then kind of developed with time. So the second kind of factor that could also lead to population structure was admixture. So Nowler proposed this idea that PS could also be caused due to differential admixture between two different ancestral population over generations. So this uh, kind of originated from his 1980 study of Chila River American Indian community. This community is interesting because it has exceptionally high diabetes rate. And this rate as shown in the table was found to be correlated with the American Indian ancestry. So the Indian heritage is zero, four and eight means how many Indian heritage grandparents do you have? And you can see here the frequency, uh, you can see here the, the diabetes incidence was clearly correlated with this, as was the GM uh, allele, which they found to be associated not only to diabetes, but also to ancestry, but in a negative way. So you can see as the GM allele frequency uh, decreases, the association increases. So there's another category which people often consider, which is population structure due to inbreeding. Uh, but we will kind of cover it in another separate section of related to it. So, we have seen that inclusion of geographically distinct populations lead to structure. But what is the source of allele frequency differences in the geographically distinct population? The reason for this lies primarily in the history of human migration. So, this journey would take us around 200,000 years before now. And at that time, there were people definitely moving around in various parts of Africa. And the estimates suggest that the number were kind of in, at least in thousands. And also recent research shows that there were some initial divisions within these groups. So around 50 to 70,000 of year, years ago, shown in, as shown in this picture, uh, driven possibly like climate change, a group of individuals left Africa in the so-called out of Africa migration, which is shown by the solid green line. So it, we need to note that there have actually been migrations both before and after this particular migration event, but this is still critically important because a bulk of non-African ancestry that is around could be associated to this event. So that as you can see here, the members of the, this group kept on expanding their range reaching to Middle East and then gradually to Indian subcontinent in a few thousand years. And then they still kept on moving, traversing all the way through Asia to reach Australia. So the migration to Europe is estimated to have been halted for a while due to prevailing isolation in Europe. However, people originating from this OOA stock gradually traversed Europe and they had well-known interactions with Neanderthals before replacing them from the landscape. So the peopling of America, as you can see, began much later, some, somewhere around 15 to 20,000 years ago. And the other interesting thing, which is shown in this recent review by Nielsen, is that there have been so many other migrations in the last few thousand years, which are shown by the yellow lines. And so you can see migrations and gene flow have been common throughout the history. So now we would kind of like, we understand that, but the, a key question here would be that how this migration could cause allele frequencies to change. So this is a figure. The figure on the left kind of suggests how events such as out of Africa migration could have impacted genetic diversity and differentiation. So as you could see, if a, uh, on your top right, that if a small group of individuals moves out of the main population, only a part of the genetic diversity of the main population is represented in this. So this is called the founder effect. And what happens is that the cartoon, which is in the middle, kind of illustrates genetic drift, which is random change in allele frequency. And this genetic drift is always more prominent in smaller populations. So being smaller, the founder population experiences more drift, and therefore the differences between them and, them and the main population magnifies over generations. 
So what's interesting is that migrant groups which emerge from this founder population will have yet lower diversity and still different allele frequencies to the main population. This leads to what is known as the serial founder effect, which accompanies rapid migration followed by settlement. So which is kind of shown in the figure on your left. So this in time would lead to significant differentiation in allele frequencies between the source population and various migrant populations. So in this toy example, what you can see is the red and blue variants are kind of completely lost in the final population, whereas the frequency of green allele, which was very rare in the original population, has now increased significantly. So this is kind of like an illustration of how things might happen. So the other force, I mean, which also plays a very key role in changing allele frequencies is the selection. So as migration involves adaptation to new environment, diet, and pathogens, the, the natural selection becomes very important. And the alleles which favor survival and reproduction in the new environment reaches much higher frequencies with time, as depicted in the bottom right figure. It needs to be noted that the source population also experiences change in climate because climate keeps on changing around the globe. And, there, and also changes in diet and evolution of new pathogens Therefore, natural selection also keeps on changing their allele frequencies, leading to further differentiation between the two groups. So just to kind of see one example of how natural selection changes allele frequencies. So this is one of the best studies cases of selection related to phenotypic adaptation. We mentioned a bit ago, this is lactose persistence, a phenotype for adults to have the ability to digest milk. So the plot on the top, left shows the distribution of this phenotype and you can see how the phenotype is almost absent in some parts of Africa and also East Asia which is kind of shown in blue and have you ever wondered why Chinese cuisine lacks milk as an ingredient so this might provide you some hints so even within Europe you can see the phenotype varies very widely and quite a few genetic variants that allow this ability to digest milk or confer this LP phenotype has been identified. Most of them are around the LCP MCM6 gene. And these variants are estimated to have evolved independently at different points of time. And they became very useful in a cattle rearing community and therefore spread, spread rapidly across different cattle rearing populations. The plot on your Bottom left kind of shows the variation, the variant 13910T, which you can see correlates strongly with phenotypic variation, especially in Europe. You might recall that in the Campbell study that we discussed a few slides ago, uh, a LCT variant due to these extreme differences was confounding the height association. So the allele frequencies of some other LP variants shown on your right also shows a similar geographically stratified distribution. So what you can see is that like the oldest LP phenotype is expected to be around 10,000 years ago. So what you can see is that with selection, you can have very rapid differentiation of allele frequencies among various global population. So as the focus of H3 Africa is Africa, so let us try to look at this from a more African context. So this figure is from a recent review by Karina and Matthias. And they, they kind of summarize the events in Africa in the last, let's say, 200, 300 millennia. So the first critical observation is that the, there's a very old split between Khoisan hunter-gatherer and other human lineages, which dates back to around somewhere between 200 and 300,000 years ago. The next group to diverge out were the Central African rainforest hunter-gatherers, who were referred to using the now derogatory term pygmy. So these are also estimated to have diverged quite early in the history. And then recent studies have also suggested a branching of some Western African groups, which diverged around, let's say, 100,000 years ago. And the final divergence include, event was the split of non-African, which corresponded to the out of Africa event we mentioned a while ago. So this plot kind of reiterates that there is an enormous genomic diversity in Africa and suggests that if you have set of African population, there's always a chance for observing stratification in a GWAS state. So if you have followed this divergence diagram, you could also see that the split resulted in many different groups inhibiting different parts of Africa. 
So if you go to Africa, let, if you were in Africa, let's say 15,000 years ago, you would definitely see a population composition like this. So in the south, we definitely had Khoisan. Similarly, we had Central African hunter-gatherers around the rainforest. And we had at least two different populations, one in East and one in West Africa. And then there were non-African populations who were in the northeastern borders. So what you can see here that there are two large chunks which are marked with question marks. So these are regions where we, our understanding of inhabitants is not very clear. So the next plot, the plot on your right kind of shows migrations that happened in the last, let's say 10,000, 11,000 years. So the green arrow represents the Bantu migration, which I would come to in a moment. The brown represent migration of the Eurasian populations. And you could see there are various other migrations that happened in this region. And what's interesting is traces of both original inhabitants and the migrants can be identified in many cases if you genotype samples from this geographic region. So the Bantu migration or expansion that involved movement of farmers, <coughs> sorry, around 5,000 years ago is one of the most defining events in African history, which are shown by the green arrows. So these groups moved from their homelands in Nigeria and Cameroon towards East and South and are the predominant ethnolinguistic and genetic group in Sub-Saharan Africa. What's interesting is that these migrating Bantu speakers often incorporated local populations into gen them, which included genetic signatures as well. So therefore, in spite of recent common ancestry of Bantu speaking populations, there are significant differences due to admixture with non-Bantu speakers. So as, at the whole genomic level, though they would look similar, in many regions you would find very strong differentiation. So even with only, even a GWAS with only Bantu speaking populations might hold some surprises with respect to population structure. So I hope this brief account, I mean, it has been a lot of information in a short time, but I think uh, if you really go around and look at this particular review by Matthias and Karina, this would help you to understand it better. But you can now understand that a lot of evolutionary and historical factors that cause human populations, not only from distinct geographies like Europe and Africa, but from more neighboring regions to differ genetically. And this makes pop population structure a very common problem. So before we move further, uh, let us pause for a while and see if you have any questions about this. Topic. Okay, so wisdom has a question. So the basic confounding factor is actually biased allele frequency, not mere population. Yeah, I mean, that might be a way to look at it, but I mean, then the allele frequency differences correspond to population. So, you, I mean, the population also comes in, but yeah, I mean, essentially, I mean, the biased allele frequencies, they are very important here. So any other questions? Okay, so just the last slide of this section. So I will skip the next one. Uh, so as we mentioned that population structure or, I mean, some people consider it together, some people consider it as like a separate problem, but I think it was Devlin and Reuter in 1999 who suggested relatedness between individuals. The idea that there are there, there's a presence of relatives in a set of ostensibly unrelated individuals as a possible confounder in a case control association study. So an essential assumption for GWAS, as we mentioned before, is independence of subject genomes and that the genotypes are being drawn randomly from population frequencies and cryptic relatedness kind of violates this basic assumption and could therefore confound the inference of association studies. And so because this cryptic relatedness is often related to inbreeding, so some people consider it as population structure due to inbreeding, but there are other factors as well which might lead to uh, cryptic relatedness other than associated mating or inbreeding, which are like small affected population sizes, recent bottlenecks, or even some forms of sampling biases. So that kind of explains what are the factors that, pop, I mean, that uh, generate population structure or relatedness. So in the next section, so 
as you will now appreciate that a major challenge in a GWAS study is to detect possible population structure and relatedness. So we will discuss one approach each to discuss population structure and relatedness, even before you do the GWAS study. And then you, we will discuss two approaches where you can see if there is a hint of population structure or relatedness on the basis of the initial results. So the most common or popular way to detect population structure with genotype data is the principal component analysis or PCA. And to understand how it works, so let us look at this toy example. So let's say we have genotype data uh, for three individuals, P0, P1, and P2. And then you have a four SNPs which were genotyped. So you can have eight allelic, uh, eight allelic uh, states, two for each SNP. So you can see the genotype for the first SNPs are AA, uh, PT, and AA in the three individuals. So now if you compare the allelic states, what you can see here is that uh, of the eight SNPs, the P0 and P1 are dissimilar in four states, which are state one, state two, state four, and state five. So the distance between these two individuals is considered as four. Similarly, you can see the distance between P1 and P2 is five, and between P0 and P1 is three. Uh, so, so what you can, P0 and P2 is three, sorry. So, uh, so what you can do is that you, you can just take these distances on a 2D plot, and this would provide you like a visual estimate of how these individuals are, how their relative distances between them are. So what happens if we add one more individual to this plot? So as you can see here, the distance is now represented as a matrix, uh, now requests one additional dimension. So the plot has transformed into a three-dimensional plot. And also the inferences of genetic difference has become a bit more complicated. So what happens if we add more individuals, 10, 50, 20? Uh, so what happened? Will the visualization would require more and more dimensions? and making this plot kind of impossible to interpret visually. So to address this problems, for real life data sets that consist of thousands of individuals, we need PCA. So this PCA normally uses a method, which is a mathematical method, which is called Aiken decomposition, that based on this distance matrix produces a set of Aiken vectors and Aiken values. So what are Aiken values? The Aiken values uh, indicate the relative importance of a particular dimension, whereas Aiken vectors shows the coordinates of each individual in that particular dimension. So I think, I mean, this is a bit of mathematical concept, but you will see the implementation is much simpler. So, and what's interesting about PCA, what makes this so widely used is that this, uh, this mathematical uh, transformation has a few characteristics. For example, the, the first and the most important is while the number of dimensions or components are reduced, the relative distance between individuals are preserved in a PCA. And also, as the components are ordered by importance, the first PC reflects the maximum variation in the data, the second PC, the next level of variation, and so on. So generally, the first few PC captures almost the entire meaningful variation in the data, and you could kind of represent this in of just a set of few two-dimensional plot. So to see how PCA really looks, so this is a PCA showing 14 different populations from Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. And this is based on the 1000 Genomes 2012 study. So what you can see here is that in a PCA, each population is assigned a particular symbol, so which are shown in the right-hand side of the plot, the legion. And uh, each individual from that population is shown by a point having the corresponding symbol. So each dot or each point is a individual and the symbol kind of tells you which population it comes from. And as you can see, most populations form a rather tight cluster, proximal to genetically similar populations. So PCA also kind of maintains the affinities. And in this PCA, what you can see the x-axis, which is the first PC, separates African populations from other global populations. Whereas PC2, uh, which is on the y-axis, separates European populations, which are shown in blue, from the East Asian populations, which are shown in green. 
And this PC also reveals another interesting aspect that in an admixed population, such as the A's W, which is shown in dark brown open, open circles, uh, open squares to your right, what you can see is that this population is from a line between the two source population, which for A's W are the European and the African population. So you could also detect some hints of admixture using this. So here you can see that PCA can provide clear distinction of populations from different continents, uh, but could it discriminate closer populations? Let us say populations from a particular continent or a country. And this actually leads to a more basic question to what extent population structure can be detected using SNP data with PCA. So the first conclusive answer to this question was perhaps this figure from the famous and often cited a paper by Nogambri, which shows that on the basis of around half a million SNPs, you, uh, so this is kind of European individuals sampled from two cities, uh, Lausanne in Switzerland and London. So what you can see is that based on a half a million SNPs, not only this population from distinctive clusters in, correspondent, in correspondence to their ethnolinguistic affiliation, but also these clusters kind of reflect the geographic map of Europe. So therefore, um, a PCA when properly applied can actually bring in entire uh, subtle structures in the, in the population you are studying. And this also has a corollary kind of demonstrates that there are subtle structures that, are, that exist even within a country or uh, even within a cosmopolitan city such as uh, London. So Therefore, this demonstrates the enormous power of PCA. So let's say if you are doing a PCA for your study, that data might not look as cool as this, but nonetheless, it's, it's going to be very informative. So we will just see three plots from three recent publications to kind of see this. So the plot on your left, uh, top left, is, is, is kind of a recent study, and this is a very normal way to represent PCs of cases and controls. So the cases are shown in red and the controls are shown in blue. The two main things to look at here are the overall, overall patterns of distribution of populations. I mean, what you see is how tight a, tight a cluster these populations form, and whether the cases and controls are kind of distributed in uniformly or they are kind of biased to either side. So looking at this plot, the plot on your top left, do you think this population has a structure? Definitely. So the second blue cluster, which you see, is has almost no corresponding cases. So it is often good to include global populations in your PCA to contextualize your data. So for example, the plot on your top right has cases and controls along with various populations from the HapMap data. So what here the CEU represents the European, YRI, the African, and A is in the Asian population. So what does this plot say? Firstly, this kind of says that this GWAS was performed definitely on European population because the cases and control kind of cluster with the European. Uh, and what it also shows that the, the cluster is kind of tight, but what, uh, and, but there are outliers and in both cases and controls and the, you see an observed climb towards the Asian, which is the Asian ancestry. And this kind of also says that perhaps this observed climb of outliers is due to some amount of ASN and admixture. The plot at the bottom is from our colleague Benisa's paper. So this was published earlier this year. So it kind of shows PCA for a quantitative trade study. So the plot contextualizes the participants from Soweto shown in red with respect to East and West African populations, which are shown in green, yellow, and blue. So what is important about quantitative traits is because you do not have cases and controls, so you do not see that structure, but it still kind of enables you to identify the overall structure and detect outliers. So the other part of PCA that makes it so popular is perhaps the ease of analysis. I hope Sean has mentioned it to you. You just need one to type one command in blink minus minus PC and then hey, you have your PC here. So, and there are a lot of R scripts which can be used for plotting PCA. However, I mean, there's a tool Genesis designed by Scott and which makes this visualization a cakewalk. So for those who plan to run PCA, I would strongly recommend you to have a look at this tool. So this is 
the URL where you can find this tool. So let's move to the letter next. So as mentioned before, the basic assumption of the standard population-based case control study is that all samples are unrelated. So that is the maximum relatedness between any two pair of individuals should be less than the second and third degree relatives. And so if you have presence of either duplicates or related individuals in the data sets, this may introduce bias and cause like the genotypes which are in families to be overrepresented. I think Sean has covered this in IPT. So I would give you, I would skip this a bit. But just to kind of summarize, I mean, you can just use a simple command again in Flink minus minus genome that compares IVT values between each pair of individuals in your data set. And you can see here, uh, here IVT value of one would indicate either a duplicate or a monozygotic twin. 0.5 is the first degree relative siblings, 0.25 should be second degree relatives, and 0.125 should be third degree relatives. So the presence of individuals with more than second degree relatedness would flag that there is some problem in your data set and you cannot go ahead and do association unless you really address this problem. So the third, the, the third method, method which we use, which is done after actually you have performed the association is also proposed by Devlin and Reuter. You might remember them suggesting the cryptic relatedness. So this is a very intuitive measure to detect BS based on association results. So the basic idea behind this measure is an assumption that the presence of population structure, in presence of a population structure, the chi-squared statistic is inflated by a constant inflation factor. So that is all the chi-square would be inflated to the same extent, which was defined as the empirical median of the n unrelated statistics divided by the expected mean under the null distribution. So this the definition looks complex, but you can see the equation is much simpler. So what you are doing is you are dividing all the all the chi squares that you are seeing for your different steps and then you are dividing it by a um, kind of like a, a, a median which you assume to be 0 0.0456 so in theory the lambda should be equal to one for a homogeneous population so if it deviates you need to be worried especially if it deviates and becomes greater than one so any value greater than 1.05 indicates presence of structure However, you need to note that, as shown by Clayton Atel in this 2005 paper, that this could be due to other reasons as well and not only population structure in your data set. So there could be differential bias or missingness, which would also lead to inflation of the lambda values. So Plink also estimates this for you very easily. So you just need to use a you just need to sorry, yeah, you just need to use a command. Uh, minus minus adjust when you're running association and this would give you an in the log files this would tell you what the genomic inflation of your data set was so next we look into the qq plots the quantile quantile plot is also a very routinely applied measure to look into population structure from association results so the qq plot is a scattered plot and what you can see is that so where it, what it contains is the observed rank p values from largest to smallest. And it, this is plotted against the theoretical values, uh, which is based on an assumption of no association. And what you see that if the statistics come from null distribution, which is that there is no structure, the plot should go along linearly as seen in the figure. So large and early deviation from this diagonal indicates population structure. So we'll see it in the next slide. And there are a score of R scripts which you can use to draw QQ plots. So this is also very easy. So to in so here is three kinds of QQ plots. So though the younger folks might not know this, but many of our and probably two previous generations have adored this Clint Eastwood movie, Good, Bad, Ugly. So let's begin with the good QQ plot on the on the top right. So what you can see here is the black dots correspond to the observed p corresponding to the observed p-values deviate quite late from the diagonal. And you have very few, few values as top association hit. So if you see something like this, you are riding good luck. So this is good, you don't need to worry about this. The bottom left plot has the black dots deviating onto the right of the diagonal. 
So this confirms that there is no structure because, I mean, it's only important when it uh, deviates to the other side. However, it's bad because it tells you that there is no association signal in your data as well. The bottom right plot demonstrates the ugly. So you can see that there's an ugly leftward deviation from the diagonal and many, many values of the diagonal. So this indicates population structure, also known as trouble. So we, the, although we do not have time for these and these are not applied very often, but I would like to mention that there are a number of other approaches to identify population structure in a data. So it might be interesting to play with one or two in a lazy afternoon. So before we move to the final section on correcting structure, I would like to pause again and take questions. Okay, so there are a lot of questions. So I can see one from Lesedi, can lambda be less than one? And what would that imply? So Lesedi, as I mentioned, lambda less than one would imply that you don't have structure. So you need not worry about this. Uh, okay. So tools perform PCA as wisdom. So this was just use Blink. How distance calculated between different populations? So this is this distance is calculated by the based on genotype and eigen decomposition. Are the terms confound and covariate interchangeable? Do they mean the same thing? If not, what's the difference? So for most practical purposes, they mean the same thing. So we use them interchangeably. Okay, so are there other questions? No, so if not, we'll then move to the final section, which is correcting for population structure. So here we will just, just kind of come back to the PCA-based and the GIF-based corrections that we, uh, I mean, approaches that can also be used for correction. And then we'll finally introduce a method called linear mixed model and see how it can be used to address both population structure related things. So let's begin with PC. Sean might have told you that it's kind of routine that you know outliers based on PC. So let's start with this example, which we have seen a bit, a few slides ago. So this is drawn, this is very easy. So you draw a boundary around the cluster containing the code of pieces and controls. Here you can see a boundary is already drawn and you exclude all the individuals which are outside this bound. So this looks quite simple, right? But not always. So if you are looking into this paper, from, this plot from Vanessa's paper, you you see, you see that there is kind of a hint of outliers, but then you can draw numerous circles. And there is a bit of arbitrariness about which circle you will choose. And this, there is no like straightforward answer to this, but if you look into the pop utils tool, tool kit in the SPIMB website or the WITS bioinformatics website, there is a script which, if you kind of say that I want to remove 50 outliers, would try to draw the best circle removing 50 outliers. But is this correction enough? Probably not. Moreover, uh, if you see a structure like this in a complicated scenario like this, which circle would you draw? And, any, and if perhaps any circle you draw, you would exclude a large number of samples and thereby re reduce the power of your GWAS significantly. Therefore, while PCA-based outlier removal, as Sean might have mentioned, it is essential part of QC, it is not often comprehensive. And in cases, it's also difficult to implement because you lose sample sizes. So therefore, the main utility is therefore to use PCs as covariates. So this is a, this, this is a kind of rather simple. So what you do is that for, you take the first n principal components selected on the basis of distribution of values. So you take those principal components which have very high values. We, so we usually tend to take something between three and 10, and then you incorporate them into the regression testing model. So as you can see in this regression equation, the, uh, the vectors are kind of included as Z1 and Z2. So what you do is it kind of uses them as covariate to model this and to prove that this works, you can see this plot next to it. So the QQ plot here on the left kind of shows that there's a very strong population structure with the genomic inflation or lambda about 1.447. But as soon as you include PCs, 
this brings it down to mere 1.03 so it turns an ugly duty to a good one so that's a very useful technique which you can use and also i think as sean has mentioned removing uh, related individuals is also a very essential part of qc and normally because there is genotyping errors ld population structure etc instead of using a 0 0.0 to 0 0.25 cutoff for removal of second degree, degree relatives we actually use a more pragmatic cutoff of 0.1875 which is halfway between the second and the third degree relatives and the individuals to remove is often selected on the basis of low missingness so if you have two related individuals you try to remove the individual which has more missingness the first problem with this kind of hard cutoff is that in some cases this may take a lot of individuals out which is worrying secondly there might still be distant relatives like which are not perhaps in the second degree but which are in the fourth degree but if you have enough number of them that could still kind of lead to spurious associations so while this is a way to correct for relatedness it's not always optimal especially if you have a lot of highly related individual or even a lot of distantly related individual in your data sets so the next correction is the genomic control based correction so this correction can be implemented just using the minus qc along with the minus adjust minus minus adjust flag while running the association link so it's very simple and what it does is that this correct for the correct the association statistics by the inflation factors and reports the adjusted p values so this is very easy and fast to compute it deals with both cryptic relatedness as well as population stratification so it is very widely used however there are some problems firstly it's difficult to implement if you have a non additive model the second major issue is that this correction is applied to all the variants however in reality some snps exhibit more difference in allele sequences than other and this uniform correction kind of is perhaps not always appropriate and leads to loss of power and finally the threshold where you start applying gc is also kind of empirical and there is no strict guidelines to it so that's also another you can go ahead and minor problem don't worry so typically i should have stopped my presentation here but uh, I, I, yeah, but, but, but I think I'm encroaching a bit into lecture seven, but I will still try to introduce the final model, which you will understand far better after lecture seven. And you'll also see why it's so important in terms of population structure. And the trend to, in the association studies is act, in the last five years, especially has moved more from link based or linear regression based models to this, these kind of models these are called linear mixed models so to understand how it works let us begin with the figure first so the plot on your left shows a distribution of variables let's say this is dmi so what you see is that there's a lot of noise in this data the plot on your right hand side however side however shows that this data is actually a combination of data from various subpopulations and if you look carefully each subpopulation kind of forms tight distributions so what LMM allows you is to perform associations for these distinct subgroups rather than the whole noisy data. So the basic equation here models the genotype in terms of not only on the basis of the genotype, but also co covariates, inherent structures, and whatever else you want to include. So linear mixed models in a sense are an extension of simple linear model, but this allows you to model both fixed effects and random effects. And this is especially useful if you have some kind of non-linear, non-independence in your data, such as something arising from hierarchical structure as shown in the figure. So just to kind of define fixed effects are those which applies to all the samples in the data and random are the ones which applies only to some of the samples. So population structure is definitely kind of considered as a fixed effect. So can linear mixed model deal with relatedness as well? The answer is yes so what you can do is that in addition in addition to using pcs as covariates as demonstrated here you could also use a variable that takes care that takes care of the random effect of relatedness so you can see this is, here is given by the line variable so for this what is done is a kinship kinship matrix that contains information on genetic relatedness between each pair of individual is generated and then it's used as a covariate in the model 
And also like most software which run uh, LMM have this module to, uh, to kind of build kinship matrix in them. So you don't even need to worry about that. So you just need to specify a command and then it's kind of implemented. So there are a lot of tools that you can use to implement LMM. So Gemma, Emac, Bold LMM, these are very popular ones. And for the H3 GWAS pipeline, I think we will use both Gemma and Bold LMM. So I'm not going very deep into this because I think this would again be covered in the association lecture. The only issue that I would like to flag is that for these approaches, I mean, these approaches are basically defined for large sample sizes. For example, if you go to the Bold LMM manual, they kind of recommend only for sample sizes greater than 5,000. So while this might take care of population structure, relatedness, etc., it might be necessary to take extra caution with the results because you might have also some kind of false positives. So I think we have covered a, almost all the possible approaches that you can use to correct for population structure and relatedness. So, but when to use which one, right? So this graphic kind of provides you a very, ah, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, now this graphic kind of provides you a hint of which one to use. So you can see on the x-axis we have uh, cryptic relatedness. So the relatedness increases from like completely independent to very related. On the y-axis we have population structure. So it goes from homogeneous to structured. So what, I mean, there are various scenarios you can have with your data. So the best scenario, the dream scenario is that you have homogeneous and independent population. So you are done, just run an association and go away. But I mean, this is seldom the case. So if you have a moderate level of structure and let's say, uh, I mean, if you have moderate level of structure, the PC based correction is your way forward. Again, if you have like moderate to high level of relatedness, then the mixed model with kinship matrix is your way forward. And if you have still high level of structure, you might consider meta-analysis to validate your results. Similarly, if you have very, very high relatedness, you need to worry that whether it's unrelated GWAS or it's kind of family-based study. And also like if you have both high population structure and cryptic relatedness, then you have to use mixed model and include a kinship matrix as well as you need to do the PC-based correction. And unfortunately, in our like experience with especially the Avigen cohort, we see this is not a very uncommon scenario in an African setting. So, I mean, so if, if you're lucky, you might get with the easier ones, but be prepared to run the more difficult ones as well. So just to kind of summarize the take home messages from this, the population structure, sorry, Population structure often confounds inheritance and needs to be addressed for a successful genome-wide association study. There are a variety of computational approaches to enable meaningful association studies to be conducted in a data set which contains structure and relatedness. So if your data contains structure and relatedness, it's fine. So given the diversity of African populations and the history of migration and admixture, observing population structure in samples from most geographies is unsurprising. So do not be happy with the p-values unless you have seen the QQ plot. There might be surprises there. The different approaches for correction are better suited for different scenarios. Choose your approach judiciously. And most of the LMM-based analysis and real-life analysis are computationally intensive and require nuanced, nuanced interpretations. Especially for LMM, I mean, many tools have reported bugs in them. So if you are using this, Please spend some time looking at your results and if see they are still around, if you vary the parameters a bit or change a tool, because all initial hits might not be actual associations. So I think I would like to end here with thanks to Sumir and other organize, organizers for organizing the series and letting us share our two cents of experience. And also special thanks to those who have survived this long ordeal. Well done guys, and those who tried and they couldn't. Thank you all so much. So please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. So I'm 
I need to go to the questions. What also Oscar is asking, what are the cutoffs for high structure or cryptic relatedness that will guide on the type of correction to use? So there are not specified levels, but if you look at your data and your QQ plots, you might get a hint of like whether the basic corrections are working. So you should definitely start with a GC. And if it doesn't work or you have like 20% of your data related, then perhaps LMM is the way out. Uh, what is the concept of significant marker in a QQ plot? Okay, so that's a good question, Mazi. So what happens is that when you, when you draw a QQ plot, you have like sm some small black dots on the top left. So these are kind of mostly your best association heaps because this is arranged in terms of p-values. So the left of diagonals, the top hits are like most probably your association signals. Uh, are there any textbooks recommended for further reading? Can lambda, okay, so I think we have answered the questions. Is there anything else? Thank you, Wisdom. Okay, so I think uh, there's lots of people typing, but I don't think there's any more questions coming through. Oh, there we go. Could imputation using half map and thousand genomes lead to inflation? Uh, Issa, I think if I got your name right. Uh, just wait until Wednesday. I think you will have some answers to this question on Wednesday when we are discussing imputation. Yes, so, so it will be uploaded to the rest of the slides on the YouTube channel. Uh, Judith is asking the, the slides. Channel. I think the slides are with Sumi, so I'm not sure if they're uploading it somewhere. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, uh, thanks, Ananya, for that. Uh, it, uh, it was uh, long but very informative and very useful lecture, I think. Um, and thanks, everyone else, for, for staying in and listening. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we'll see everyone at the next lecture.